Hi again, it's Professor Erica Jones with a lecture on pneumonia. So pneumonia, super wicked common. You're going to take care of patients with pneumonia probably your entire career. Um, for this lecture, you're going to be able to identify the patho of pneumonia, what are the diagnostic studies on collaborative care to manage patients with pneumonia, distinguish between medical care associated pneumonia and community acquired pneumonia, identify the nursing process and implementation of a nursing care plan for a patient with pneumonia, and identify care of the client related to quality measures for pneumonia. So what is pneumonia? It's an infection of the lung parenchyma. It is associated with significant morbidity and mortality rates. For example, community acquired pneumonia is the sixth leading cause of death in people aged 65 years or older in the United States. What's the cause of it? It's likely to result when defense mechanisms become incompetent or when they become overwhelmed. Decreased cough and epiglottal reflexes may allow for aspiration. <clears throat> you can see these pictures here. This is a nice normal alveoli. It's kind of open and fluffy like a sponge with no water in it. And what happens is when patients get pneumonia, the fluid um, exudate from those infected particles builds up in the alveoli and there's no room for gas exchange. So, what can cause your, um, your defenses to become compromised? You can have the mucociliary mechanism impaired through pollution, cigarette smoking, upper respiratory infections like a bad sinusitis, tracheal intubation. So if you have a breathing tube placed, it's going to stent open your airway and allow all sorts of gook to get in there. And just natural aging can make a person more um, more suspect to having pneumonia. And chronic diseases will also suppress your immune system. There are three different ways that organisms can reach the lungs. One is aspiration from the nasopharynx or oropharynx. Number two is inhalation of microbes present in the air. And number three is hematinate <laughs> hematogenous spread from a primary infection elsewhere in the body. This is less common, but it happens with patients who have like, um, you know, terrible, terrible UTI that's left untreated and it can th spread through the bloodstream to, um, to the lungs. I've had patients with like lines in place, like a central line who've had a terrible infection that spreads to the lung parenchyma. This is rare, but it usually is a pretty serious infection. So our case study is Miss DT. She's an 88-year-old lady who lives alone. <clears throat> She's been feeling weaker over the past couple days, and last night she became confused and disoriented. <clears throat> Excuse me, and remember, any mental status change in your patient should prompt you to get a set of vitals, including an oxygen saturation, because oftentimes the quick, you know, the earliest sign that a patient's hypoxic is gonna be mental status changes. So her housekeeper notified her daughter who brought DT to the clinic. She complains of coughing over the past three days. She has a history of mild heart failure that's treated medically, but no other significant health disorders. And she last saw her healthcare provider four months ago. So what are her risk factors for pneumonia? Well, she's elderly, right? She has a little bit of heart failure. And based on her history, what type of pneumonia would you suspect DT has? So she last saw her provider four months ago and she lives in the community. So it's highly likely she has community acquired pneumonia. So we can classify pneumonia in a couple different ways. It can be classified according to the causative organism, like my patient has a pseudomonas pneumonia or they have a MRSA pneumonia. But more typically you see a clinical classification. So it can be considered a community acquired pneumonia or a medical care associated acquired pneumonia. And that medical care pneumonia is broken down into a couple different um, acronyms here. You can call it hospital associated pneumonia, ventilator associated pneumonia, or healthcare associated pneumonia. But we bunch those together and call it medical care associated pneumonia.
So community acquired pneumonia occurs in patients who have not been hospitalized or resided in a long-term care facility within 14 days of the onset of symptoms. It can be treated at home or the patient can be hospitalized depending on their condition. And the trick with pneumonia is to make sure that empiric antibiotic therapy is started as soon as possible. And by empiric, we mean we're just going to cover it. We're just going to give them antibiotics. We don't have a culture. We don't have an organism, but we need to treat. Medical care associated pneumonia, or MCAP, if it's considered hospital-acquired pneumonia, it occurs 48 hours or longer after admission. So they consider it wasn't incubating at time of hospitalization. Or if it's a VAP, a ventilator-associated pneumonia, it can occur more than 48 hours after endotracheal intubation. So the patient had a breathing tube placed, and two days later, they get a pneumonia. That would be considered a VAP. And there are financial penalties for patients who have VAPs. So there are certain bundles that are put in place when a patient has an endotracheal tube to prevent them from getting pneumonia. So medical care associated pneumonia continued. Hospital care associated pneumonia is a new onset pneumonia in a patient who was hospitalized for two days or longer within 90 days of the infection or resided in a long-term care facility or received recent IV antibiotic therapy, chemotherapy, or wound care within the past 30 days or attended a hospital or hemodialysis clinic. Basically, they've had some interaction with the healthcare system. So this is also considered medical care associated pneumonia. Now, why do we differentiate between community acquired and medical acquired because it's going to guide your treatment and the treatment is based on the patient's known risk factors early versus late onset and the probable organism that could be infecting the patient multi-drug resistant organisms like your MRSA, your VRE, your VISA, they are major problems in treating healthcare acquired pneumonia, which is one of the reasons why it's differentiated as a healthcare or medical care acquired versus community acquired. Community acquired pneumonias probably are gonna be fine, you know, treating that with like Augmentin, but if the patient was in a wound clinic or had hemodialysis, they could have a MRSA or a, you know, terribly resistant Pseudomonas or some bacteria that needs uh, stronger antibiotics. Aspiration pneumonia can occur either in the community or as a medical care acquired pneumonia and it results specifically from abnormal entry of secretions into the lower airway. Major risk factors for aspiration pneumonia include decreased level of consciousness. Awake alert people typically don't have issues with breathing in their own secretions. Difficulty swallowing, so patients who have had a stroke or have dysphagia for other reasons might not be able to manage their secretions and might have uh, pneumonia because of that and also nasogastric intubation. So this patient here has an NG tube. It goes down the back of the throat and into the stomach, but it can also be a track for bacteria to kind of march down and it may increase the patient's risk of aspiration pneumonia, especially if the tube is malpositioned. Aspiration pneumonia happens because the material aspirated triggers an inflammatory response. Typically, patients get a bacterial infection from this <clears throat> therapy. Remember, empiric therapy, we're going to treat without a known cause or a known bug. We're going to base that on the severity of the illness, where the infection was acquired, and pos probable causative organism. So if I'm caring for a patient who has an aspiration pneumonia, who, you know, was, say, they were down, you know, because of maybe they had like a drug overdose and they were down for several hours before they came into the hospital um, and they have a pneumonia, I might be tempted to have the provider use a stronger antibiotic because I know that they are at high risk for, you know, more severe pneumonia just because of the way that it occurred. Um, 
Initially, if patients aspirate um, gastric contents, that can be treated with just like steroids, and it's considered a non-infection, non-infectious or chemical pneumonitis. You might see a patient who was treated with like a shot of solumedrol for difficulty breathing, and then they improved, and it was because they didn't have an actual bacterial infection, they just had some gastric secretions causing irritation in the lungs. So you also can have an opportunistic pneumonia, which affects patients specifically at risk. So patients including those with severe malnutrition, immune deficiencies, chemotherapy or radiation recipients, and patients on long-term corticosteroids. These are patients that are at risk for pneumonia that wouldn't cause issues in a healthy, in a healthy person. Um, one good example of this is a pneumocystis gerovece pneumonia. It used to be called pneumocystis carinae pneumonia. Um, the onset of this is slow and subtle. It uh, causes pretty, it can be a pretty significant appearing pneumonia. If you Google uh, PJP pneumonia, sometimes you can see like total whiteout. It, it's ugly looking. Um, it can be life threatening and it can spread to other organs by hematogenous spread. Um, and you're going to treat it with Bactrim, uh, IV, or orally. And a lot of patients, so this typically affects patients who have uh, AIDS, which we don't see that much because the treatment for HIV is so much better now than it used to be, and it's so much more easily accessible. But, you know, back in the 80s when patients had full-blown AIDS and weren't getting diagnosed and treated, appropriately, there was a lot of pneumocystis carinae or pneumocystis gerovecci pneumonia. And um, now people that have, you know, low CD4 counts or who have, you know, immune deficiency because of AIDS, they'll be on Bactrim um, just prophylactically. People can also get uh, cytomegalus virus pneumonia. This is caused by the herpes virus. It can be asymptomatic and it cause anywhere from mild to severe disease. And it's life-threatening in immunosuppressed people. Um, it's treated with antiviral medications because it is a viral pneumonia and high dose immunoglobulin. So what's the patho of pneumonia? What really happens? Um, you have an inflammatory response because of these uh, infectious particles. The alveoli fill with fluid and debris, like that first picture I showed you. Um, it causes lung consolidation. You have an increased production of mucus, which can lead to airway obstruction, and both of those things contribute to decreased gas exchange or hypoxia. As the infection resolves, you get treated with antibiotics. The macrophages in the alveoli ingest and remove the debris, and normal lung tissue is restored, and your gas exchange should return to normal. So what clinical manifestations of pneumonia is Miss DT displaying? Well, she's confused. She's probably hypoxic. She hasn't been feeling well. Um, for what other clinical manifestations would you assess DT? What are you concerned of with a patient that has an infection? And specifically a lung infection. So you're going to make sure you take her temperature, see what, you know, how she's responding to this. And you would want to um, check her oxygen saturation and her respiratory rate. What diagnostic tests are you going to expect the practitioner in the clinic to order? And because it's a lung issue, my thought would be that the provider is probably going to order a chest x-ray at, at least and probably some blood. So what are clinical manifestations of pneumonia? The most common ones are cough, fever, shaking chills, dyspnea, tachypnea, pleuritic chest pain, and off-colored sputum. So it can be green, yellow, or even rust-colored. And for older or more debilitated patients, it's not uncommon to see a change in mentation. Um, patients that have pneumonia often report chest 
pain or abdominal pain from coughing because they cough frequently when they have pneumonia, they're trying to clear that airway. Not only can patients have pain, but they can also, in some of your more elderly debilitated patients, they can break ribs because of the cough. Um, you're gonna wanna teach your patients to splint so that they can cough a little more comfortably and make sure that you encourage them to get that stuff out of their lungs. Clinical manifestations of pneumonia include a ronchi and crackles. They can have a whole symphony of breath sounds uh, depending on how sick they are and what type of uh, pneumonia they have. They can have bronchial breath sounds. Uh, they can have egophony or increased fremitus. These are two kind of advanced assessment techniques that we don't really use that much, but you can look at them um, in your Lewis text. They can have dullness to percussion if a pleural effusion is present. And please take some time and review this focused assessment for pneumonia and abnormalities in your Lewis text. Complications of pneumonia can include pleurisy, pleural effusion, atelectasis, bacteremia, and empyema. So from top to bottom, you know, pleurisy is lung inflammation. It makes it really painful for these patients to breathe when they have pneumonia. Pleural effusion is fluid that builds up in the lungs. Atelectasis, there's a nice picture here of atelectasis. That's when your lung um, parenchyma become compressed and uh, don't inflate nicely. So I'm trying to move my cursor here. So this little line here is uh, showing the lung kind of compressed into a flat line. That's atelectasis. Um, and they can have bacteremia. They can have blood infections because of an untreated pneumonia and it can lead also to an empyema, which is an infection, kind of like a purulent uh, infection in the, in the lung. Complications can also include pericarditis, meningitis, sepsis, acute respiratory failure up to and including intubation and artificial ventilation, and pneumothorax or a collapsed lung. Uh, pericarditis is infection of the sac surrounding the heart. Meningitis is infection of the spinal cord meninges or the brain. And sepsis is like a systemic inflammatory response because of an infection. These are pretty severe complications from pneumonia. <clears throat> Diagnostic tests that are used include your history and physical examination, chest x-ray, there can be a sputum analysis, a CBC with differential to see if the patient has a white blood cell count. They'll be assessing the patient's oximetry or arterial blood gas values. And all of these can be reviewed uh, in your table there in the Lewis textbook. Also, patients can have blood culture sent. They can have a thoracentesis if there's like some sort of fluid that needs to be tapped. They can go in from the um, chest wall and take some of that fluid for evaluation. Patients who are intubated may need a bronchoscopy, which is where they put a small flexible camera down the endotracheal tube and they can take samples directly from the lungs. Um, and they might check these biologic markers, uh, CRP or procalcitonin. They might check a uh, sed rate too, depending. Those are, you know, used typically to see how well a patient's responding to antibiotics. So DT's chest x-ray reveals a consolidation in her left lower lobe, consistent with pneumonia. Her white count is 17,000 with an increased number of bands. Her electrolytes and her um, BNP, which is a brain natriuretic peptide, which is a measure of heart failure, those are both within normal limits. And she has a sputum sample scent, which shows gram-positive diplococci and many white blood cells. Because of her age and her altered mentation, the healthcare provider admits her to the hospital for treatment. On admission, DT has bronchial breath sounds with dullness of the left lower lobe and egophony. Her oxygen saturation is 87%. What is your priority of care for DT? I hope you all get her oxygen up. So you're going to make sure that she has oxygen administered to help support her while she's ill and you're gonna to wanna to make sure she gets antibiotics. Um, because of the um, 
result of her gram stain, she probably has a strep pneumoniae pneumonia. And one of the things that we can do as nurses to help our patients, especially those over age 65, have healthier uh, lives is to promote getting the pneumonia vaccine. So pneumonia vaccine prevents specifically strep pneumococcus pneumonia. It's indicated for patients that are 65 or older or younger than 65 who have long-term health problems or immunosuppression and for adults age 19 to 64 who smoke or have asthma. And especially it's recommended for patients who live in nursing homes or a long-term care facility. The patient is gonna get antibiotics. A repeat chest X-ray, uh, depending on where the patient is, if the patient's hospitalized in the ICU, they'll probably you know, get a chest X-ray every day on that patient or if they have any problems with oxygenation. But for outpatients, the um, findings on chest X-ray after pneumonia treatment usually don't change for like four weeks or even more. It takes a while for that pneumonia to resolve on a chest X-ray. So it may be that Miss DT gets her treatment and she doesn't get a repeat chest X-ray just because we know if the patient improves clinically, there might not be that much utility for a repeat chest X-ray. Um, for supportive care, you're going to make sure that she has some oxygen for her hypoxemia. You're going to give her analgesics for her chest pain because it's painful to cough all that time. If she has a fever, you're going to give her antipyretics. And you're going to make sure that you individualize her rest and activity. Um, your patients with pneumonia are going to be tired and they're not going to want to do anything, but you as a nurse are going to make sure that you get her up out of that bed, put her in the chair, take her for a walk around the unit, keep her active because we don't want this elderly female who is previously independent to end up in the bed with muscle atrophy and having difficulty moving around because she had a pneumonia. It's important for our patients with pneumonia that we continue to mobilize them. They breathe better when they're up in the chair, even if they just get up in the chair at the side of the bed, it's important to promote activity. Um, and if the patient has a pneumonia that's caused by a virus or influenza, they may um, receive antivirals for that. So for drug therapy, always the patients are started on empiric therapy. This is based on, the, based on the likely infecting organism and the risk factors for multi-drug resistant organism. It varies with localities. So, you know, a critically ill patient at Hartford Hospital who we're concerned about a serious pneumonia, we're going to give them vanco, cefepime, and tobramycin or levoquin. And at Bay State Medical Center, their typical um, empiric therapy is vancomycin and zosin. So it really varies depending on your facility and your locale and what the likely offending organisms are. Patients that are given antibiotics, you should see an improvement, a reduction in fever, increased ease of breathing, increased oxygenation, should see an improvement in three to five days. If my patient with pneumonia isn't improving in like two days after starting antibiotics, I'm going to be concerned that I chose the wrong antibiotic and that they need it switched up. Um, patients in the hospital are almost always going to get IV antibiotics because insurance will not pay for a patient hospitalized who doesn't need IV therapy. The plan though should be to switch them to oral antibiotics as soon as the patient is stable. And for pneumonia, typically patients get five days of antibiotic therapy. It can be increased. Certainly a patient who has serious complications of pneumonia will need more than that. Nutritional therapy, you want to make sure these patients are well hydrated because that's going to improve their ability to cough up the mucus. Lots of fluids, lots of water, lots of, um, you know, good fluids to make sure that the patient has the ability to thin the mucus and cough it up. And you're also going to offer them high calorie, small, frequent meals because they're going to be tired. They're not going to want to sit down to a huge turkey dinner. You're going to want to make sure you offer them frequent meals and snacks that are dense in nutrition. So for your assessment, you're going to assess their health history. Do they have any um, debilitating diseases? Do they have lung cancer, COPD? Do
they have diabetes or malnutrition, something that might prevent them from healing up well? Do they use antibiotics or corticosteroids? Are they on chemotherapy or any immunosuppressant drugs? Have they recently had abdominal or thoracic surgery where perhaps something was introduced to the body? Have they been intubated recently and are they receiving tube feedings? Do they smoke or use alcohol? Have they had respiratory infections in the past? What's their typical nutritional intake like and their level of activity? Are they um, independent in doing their activities of daily living? Are they from a facility where they don't really do much of anything for themselves? Um, do they have difficulty breathing? And you're gonna assess cough. Are they bringing anything up with that cough? And is it painful for them to breathe or cough because of their pneumonia? Objective data, you're gonna monitor for a fever. You're gonna monitor their level of consciousness. Are they restless or lethargic? Are they splinting the affected area when they cough? Do they have rapid breathing, tachypnea? Are their chest movements symmetric or asymmetric? And are they using their accessory muscles? And if you don't, if you haven't seen use of accessory muscles, I'm gonna say it again, look it up, look it up on Google, just Google it, use of accessory muscles. It is a concerning finding in your patient with respiratory illness. For lung sounds, you can hear crackles, you can hear a friction rub sometimes. They may have dullness on percussion because of lung consolidation. There may be increased tactile fremitus if you're assessing for that. You're gonna monitor their sputum amount and color. Are there, um, do they have a rapid heart rate, tachycardia? And especially monitor in any patient who you're concerned for oxygen problems, their mental status. So patients that are awake, alert, oriented, if they are suddenly getting confused or restless or anxious, check their oxygen set, check their lung sounds, make sure that they are breathing and coughing effectively. So nursing diagnoses for these patients, impaired gas exchange, ineffective breathing pattern, and acute pain. This is a painful, painful diagnosis. Patients with pneumonia, it can be painful for them to just breathe, and you want them to take deep, deep breaths and cough. So this is a picture of your alveoli normally, nice, open, with good gas exchange, and then you see a pneumonia. There's that exudate, there's the infectious process happening. It's preventing good gas exchange, and the patient needs to be able to cough and expire all of that, um, you know, all of that mucus. Outcomes for your patient, you want them to have clear breath sounds with normal breathing patterns. You want them to not be hypoxic, so O2 sat greater than 95 or 97 percent, whatever this patient's baseline is. Normal chest x-ray, as we talked about before, this can take several weeks to resolve, and as long as they are not ill, you may not get a repeat chest x-ray. Um, no complications related to pneumonia. So you want this patient to take their antibiotics, to get well, to get off oxygen, and to go back home. <clears throat> Health promotion for these patients. You wanna make sure that they understand how important rest, regular exercise, nutrition, and hygiene is to maintain their natural resistance to pneumonia. Encourage them to cough or sneeze into their elbow, not their hands. Avoid cigarette smoke. Prompt treatment of upper respiratory infections and make sure that they get vaccinated both for the flu and the pneumococcus vaccine. And I should add to that, patients that are elderly who have risk factors will probably require, I would recommend them get the COVID vaccine as well. So how do we present, prevent pneumonia in at-risk patients? So you wanna make sure you position them properly to prevent aspiration. Head of the bed greater than 35 to 45 degrees. Make sure that the patient's repositioned every two hours. Strict adherence to the ventilator bundle to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. And you're gonna elevate the head of the bed 30 to 45 degrees for patients with a feeding tube as well and make sure that feeding tube position has been properly checked. And for patients in acute care who have a nasogastric tube in place, that means an x-ray.
You're gonna elevate the head of the bed and have them sit up for all meals, assist with eating, drinking, taking meds as needed. Assess for a gag reflex only if needed. This is one of the areas where the book and I differ. Um, for patients uh, that I care for, the only reason I'm assessing a gag reflex is if I'm concerned about them having a serious brain injury. I would never assess a gag reflex on a normal, like awake and alert person. If they can, if you can elicit a good cough and if they can swallow for you on command, um, I'm gonna leave the assessment of the gag reflex to the speech therapist. Um, mobilize them early, get them up and walking around. Use the incentive spirometer. So the incentive spirometer for a patient with pneumonia is a huge tool that you can use to help them get better quicker. And because it is an objective measure of what their lungs can do. So you're gonna have the patient hold the incentive in their hands, take a breath in, like they're pulling in on a pipe or breathing in um, low and slow. You're gonna have them inspire to raise that spirometry ball. And that will give you an objective measure of how much volume they can pull in their lungs. If they're doing their incentive spirometry um, while they're in the hospital, I tell my patients every time a commercial comes on, if you're watching TV, use that incentive spirometer because that means that at least every 15 to 20 minutes, they're practicing with the incentive. And when they take those deep breaths in, typically they're going to cough and it will help them with mucus um, expulsion and airway clearance hugely important that you teach and remind your patients frequently to use the incentive spirometer. And you're also going to make sure they use uh, their toothbrush twice a day and clean their mouth frequently. Patients with pneumonia, they're going to feel gross. They're going to have, you know, gunk that they're coughing up all the time. Take the time to brush their teeth. And if they have dentures, clean their dentures. It is, there's nothing grosser than going in to see your patient and realize that nobody's cleaned their mouth. So take some time and make sure that the oral hygiene on your patients is done. You wanna make sure they have good pain management on board so that they do inspire deeply and they are coughing those secretions out. You're gonna maintain a strict medical asepsis, including hand hygiene, both for you and your patient. You're going to keep track of what respiratory devices they're using, the incentive spirometer, make sure their oxygen cannula is cleaned and replaced according to your facility policy. Um, you might have to suction the patients if they are weak and can't expire the mucus. You might have to do either um, nasotracheal or oropharyngeal suctioning. And you're also going to want to make sure that you avoid any unnecessary antibiotic usage. So if you notice that the patient's on like vancomycin, but the culture comes back and it's sensitive to amoxicillin, you could ask the physician, hey, you know, I noticed the culture came back, we're still giving her IV vanco, do you want to reduce it to an oral antibiotic? That's absolutely something that the nurses can help with because you want to make sure you're not giving patients um, too much antibiotic for whatever ails them. So for acute intervention, you're going to do assessments on these patients frequently. Any respiratory patient kind of goes to the top of my list for assessments. You want to make sure you're giving those antibiotics on time and promptly that their oxygen therapy is implemented and implemented correctly. Again, if you have not yet, please watch the Kaplan skills videos about oxygenation. They have a whole bunch of them. They talk about nasal cannula all the way to like a Venturi mask. Please take some time and watch those videos. Um, hydration, you wanna make sure that they're drinking enough fluids, that they're well hydrated and you're gonna to wanna to support them nutritionally with high calorie, frequent meals, making sure that they have enough energy to eat correctly. And especially if the patient's there with an aspiration pneumonia, that they're sitting up, that they're wide awake, and that they're swallowing appropriately. So breathing exercises. This is a picture of the lady using her incentive spirometer. 
You want to make sure that they are using the spirometer correctly, that they're doing their breathing exercises. You want to get them up in the chair. You want to make sure that they are walking around as much as can be tolerated. The last thing you want is for a patient to have loss of function because they were hospitalized for an acute illness. You want to make sure you're giving them pain medication appropriately. And you can see this lady here has a blanket or a, maybe a folded over pillow and she's splinting her chest during coughs. So she's probably going to use that incentive spirometer, take a big breath in, and then it will trigger <coughs> her coughing and hopefully getting up some of those secretions. By teaching your patients how to splint, you can help manage their pain and encourage better airway clearance. So for our case study, DT was admitted four days ago for pneumonia. She's maintained a fine blood pressure and her mental status is intact. She was switched from IV antibiotics to oral antibiotics and she's ready for discharge. What important teaching are you gonna to provide to this patient and her family? You're gonna emphasize the need for her to finish her antibiotics. I cannot stress this enough. If the patient is feeling better, they may not want to finish the antibiotics. They may be having diarrhea as a side effect of that antibiotic. They may not like the fact that it's a horse pill and they have to take it twice a day. Tough. Make sure they understand how important it is for them to finish the full course of medications. And we want to make sure they do this to avoid any recurrence of pneumonia and specifically to avoid the the production or um, possibility of a drug resistant um, bacteria happening. So it's important that patients complete the full course of their treatment. Make sure they're aware of any drug to drug or drug to food interactions if they're on an antibiotic. Make sure they're getting adequate rest and adequate hydration. And with that, I would include adequate activity. Make sure they get out of bed every day, even if it's just to move to the recliner. Make sure that they are taking a little walk around their room or apartment or neighborhood if it's safe. Um, avoid alcohol and smoking. Um, very important ways that you can help your patient improve their health by quitting smoking. Anyone with respiratory disease, um, that's like the number one thing that they can do is quit smoking. Um, and you can refer them to Mass Public Health Resources at QuitWorks. Um, there's lots of like supports and like a quit line and um, their provider should be able to give them medications. If they're serious about quitting smoking, you should be able to give them resources to do that. Um, a cool mist humidifier is a good idea for patients with the pneumonia. It can help keep their um, mucous membranes hydrated and prevent reinfection. And you're going to tell them to follow up with their primary care about getting a follow-up chest x-ray if it's necessary and make sure that they've had their vaccinations, flu vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, and the COVID vaccine if they're eligible. For evaluation, you want to make sure you evaluate their respiratory rate, rhythm, and depth of respirations. They should have clear lungs to auscultation. They should be reporting controlled pain and the ability to inspire deeply and cough effectively. Their SAT should be above 95, barring any um, underlying respiratory illness like COPD where they might hang in the 90s. Um, you want to make sure there's no bronchi, that there's no friction rub, that you're not hearing anything weird when you listen to them. And they should be able to clear the sputum easily from the airway with an effective cough. So here's an audience, audience response question. You all can do this at home. You have a 56-year-old male who has end-stage renal disease and he's on hemodialysis three times a week. He presents with a high fever, cough, and sputum production. You suspect he has which type of pneumonia? Community-acquired pneumonia, ventilator-acquired pneumonia, medical care-acquired pneumonia, or atypical pneumonia? And the answer is... C, medical care acquired pneumonia because he was at a dialysis clinic. So he has had contact with the medical, um, the medical system. So it's medical care acquired pneumonia. All right. The nurse is caring for a patient with pneumonia. If a pleural effusion is developing, 
fluid in the lungs, the nurse would expect which finding? A barrel-shaped chest, paradoxical respirations, hyperresonance on percussion, or localized decreased breath sounds. And fluid, so if you have a patient with fluid in their lungs, they are going to have decreased breath sounds where there's fluid because you're not going to hear the air moving through that area because there's fluid there. So D is a correct answer. Decreased breath sounds.